<clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I guess good morning for those of you in New York or in other parts of the States. I'm just going to wait for some, some people to show up here. Sometimes I, you never know with this thing with Facebook. It, it could say that there's no one here, but there might be people there. Also, it could be like somebody's writing a comment, but I don't even see it. Sometimes I do see it. It's very strange. So we'll just wait for, for confirmation of, of people showing up. In the meanwhile, I'm going to restart my computer so that I can, I, can uh, I guess, get some reference points here for the stuff that I want to read to you guys. But uh, anyway, while that's happening, it is Yom HaShoah. For those of you guys that don't know, for those of you guys who live in the States, and I guess who, who are not, who haven't experienced this or, or who haven't gone through this, you know, who haven't lived in Israel, who haven't gone through this kind of cycle of, uh, I guess, holidays or commemoration days, um, Yom HaShoah is the day in Israel where we commemorate um, the, yeah, the six million who perished at the hands of the Nazis. At least that's that's what it is, I guess, supposed to be or is meant to be. That's the intention. And for me, it's very special and it's very it's very moving because you know there's something that I haven't done in about seven years and I, I totally forgot about it like I knew that today was Yom HaShoah but I forgot that there are two days uh, one day is Yom HaShoah and another day is uh, Yom HaZikaron where you know at 10 o'clock in the morning all over the country the sirens blare and you basically no matter what you're doing you you know, if you're in your car, you, you you stop your car on a dime, you get out of your car and you stand. I, th I don't know, I think it's like for two or three minutes. You know, if you're in your house, you just stand up and just stand and, you know, you're walking, I don't know, carrying groceries. You literally, every the whole country just stops for like two, two minutes and stands in silence. Majority of the country. <laughs> with, a, with the exception of maybe, you know, I don't know, a few Arabs and a few, let's say, I don't know, Hasidim somewhere in uh, Meisharim or whatever. Don't want to get into to why they don't do that. I mean, we know Arabs w wouldn't do that, but with the exception of those people, basically the whole country stands. And in my case, I it's interesting that I just forgot about this whole exercise, or I yeah, I just forgot that it was happening today. And it, all of a sudden, at ten o'clock in the morning, I just hear like a siren, and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, and I just stand up, and I oh, immediately I knew what it was. I knew what it was in reference to, obviously. <laughs> um, Especially since I I participated in a Zoom, um, you know, lecture last night about Yom HaShoah, and it's actually what I want to talk about. Um, you know, everybody thinks that Yom HaShoah is like this day to remember the Holocaust, and then this day to, you know, especially in the state of Israel, it's a day to kind of like um, somehow in your mind connect, I guess the event that was the Holocaust and the founding of the State of Israel. That's what it's meant to be doing. Um, oh, Sharon Tadmor, yeah, one minute for the Sharon, two minutes for the fallen soldier. Okay, yeah, I just wasn't sure with the time frames. So, um, it's interesting because, and you see, like, you look around and you look at all of these, you know, Hasbara organizations or these pro-Israel organizations, and, and especially on this day, but all really throughout the year, they just kind of like, are really big on not only Holocaust, Holocaust education, uh, they're really big on just connecting the founding of the state to this event. Uh, to the point where, you know, they take people, one of the first places they take them is to Yad Vashem, right? And, the, and it's like supposed to be an impactful thing and you're supposed to show people what we went through and then, you know, rise from the ashes and we build a state and all these kind of things. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to straight, say s straight and short and to the point. Um, you know, the state of Israel was not founded. Officially, it was founded in 1948, but the state of Israel did not start in 1948, and it wasn't founded as a result of the Holocaust. There was already an entire movement of building a state, of building an infrastructure, of, of, of you know, creating a government, however ragtag it was, of creating an army, 
different infrastructure components to what is needed to have a country, to have a state. These things were happening since the mid-1800s on this land, on the land that I'm sitting today, you know, in places like where I'm sitting in Abu Tor and Amik Rafaim and, and Katamon and all these places in Tel Aviv. You know, Tel Aviv was founded in 1909, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, like, <laughs> okay, so for those of you who love Tel Aviv, who are all about, you know, secular Zionism and cultural Zionism and Herzl and all these kind of things, you know, that stuff didn't start in 1948. It started in 1909. And if you want to go further, you know, places like Rosh Pinan, Petach Tikva, and Rishon Lezion, even before that, in the 1800s, okay? So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, like, the, the, the thing that happened in, in, in the 40s in the war, you know, Ruf Cook talks about how he was saying that, um, you know, when he was a chief rabbi of what was then called Palestine, he was saying that, in his opinion, World War I was the seminal moment that, you know, that kind of, um, you know, because then after that you had uh, the, the Balfour Decla Decla Declaration, you had the Ottomans leaving this land, um, you know, and he spoke about then, you know, so I guess if you start counting from the Balfour in 1917, then it was, let's say, at least almost 30 year span where we were building, um, you know, building a country, but we know what was happening before that. Again, I was saying yesterday, you can walk down here to Amik Rafaim and you can walk on something called the Rekevet. It's a, it's like a, it's like a, like a boardwalk. And at every single lamppost, you can see a little blurb talking about the history of this neighborhood or the history of, you know, like uh, the train station or the, the train that used to run there during the Ottoman empire, during the, the British were here and, you know, all these different, uh, you know, uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm, visited this place and how, you know, he was received by uh, authorities, Jewish authorities, British authorities, what have you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there's an entire history of Israel before 1948. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> and it's, and I, and I find it like, almost like, it's a disservice to the point where people in the, I guess what you would call the Hasbara community, the Israel advocacy community, just kind of gloss over that. They don't even talk about that. It's not, it's literally as if, you know, 1948, poof, we had a state. That's it. And it was all because of the Holocaust. You know, the, 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 the nations felt bad for us. And, you know, we lost all these people and they gave us a state. You know, not that we fought the British, not that we had all these groups fighting each other, Lehi, you know, um, uh, what is it called? The Irgun and, and Haganah. Not, the, not that we were fighting with each other, within each other and also enemies, you know, occupiers. And not that we kicked them out. Not that we, you know, did anything of the sort before 1948, you know, to precipitate these things. I mean, let's forget about that. Now that we had a Zionist Congress, which I just participated in, which is which started in the late 1800s. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we had all these things, and it's interesting. And 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 I noticed that like all the stuff that I just described to you, it kind of cascades into the greater society to where, you know, I I posted on my wall that I said that, you know, I had the merit. I used the word merit to stand, for the first time in seven years, the merit to stand in in uh, commemorating this day. And actually, a friend of mine who listens to this uh, to this program, who I really I value his uh, you know his input, his opinion, and I and I really thank him for watching, being a loyal I guess a viewer. He said, you know, uh, I don't understand how you could use the word merit. You know, six million people died in the Holocaust and all these kind of things. You know, like the, he was he was trying to say, uh, you know, we need Holocaust education. You have to remember these people. I don't know why you use the word merit. And I say, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. I'm using the word merit in the sense of that. The problem is, is that these, these Hasbara organizations and the secular Zionist movement, what they've done is they've taken this event, the Holocaust, and they've basically pulled it in with all of the other genocides that ever pretty much happened, you know, in the, let's say the last 200 years, right? And they pulled that in with, with those, and they've kind of extricated this event really from the story um, of what really... Of the, of the Jewish uh, timeline. Not to say that they forgot that it's Jews, right? They know that it was Jews who were killed in this event. But they don't really, you know, what we really should be commemorating this event is not uh, making a separate event out of it. We should just use, let's say, Tisha B'Av, you know, the ninth of Av, where we commemorate the destruction of the temples and, you know, the expulsion from Spain and all these things. We should we should use Tisha B'Av to remember this day, as opposed to just a separate day for this for this event, you know, if you, if you want to go down that route, right? So what they've done is they've, they've just uh, taken this event and they've made it like any other genocide, but at the same time, conversely, uh, they've given, um, they've made us very, very attached to our, 
to this identity, to this identity as a nation that had this Holocaust, and that's how our state was founded, and that we should be happy that the nations, you know, had rachamim, had a mercy on us, and then they went to the UN, and they voted by, you know, the slim margin, and, you know, and, you know the Soviet Union even voted, for other reasons, to vote, you know, to, to give us a state. We should be so happy and thankful and grateful and all these other things. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, that's, that's really, it's, it's a disservice. It's a disservice to our story. It's a disservice to our, that kind of thinking. It's a disservice to um, just all the stuff, the stuff that happened, all of, not just what I described, you know, the, the, the nation building that was happening from the mid-1800s, but it's also a disservice to all the people, all the tzaddikim, and all of the, um, you know, the, the holy people over the, over the centuries that have been praying and davening have wanted to come to this land. And some of them did, some of them didn't, some of them came, um, you know, died on the way. Some of them, when they got here, you know, there was a story of a rabbi who was basically, he got here. I think it was the Ramchal, the person who wrote all these amazing books, um, you know. And, and I think, I'm not sure if it was Ramchal, there's another rabbi who, there's a story of him arriving in Israel and then he was just like stomped by the, uh, you know, the, ho- the, the hoof of the horse of uh, an Ottoman, uh, or an Arab, or an Ottoman, I don't remember the exact story, but basically he just, he like spent all this time coming here, and then he finally gets here, and he just stomped to death by, by a horse. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, <clears throat> again, I always tell people today, if you want to come to Israel, you know, forget about tourism, even move to Israel or visit Israel, like, you go on kayak.com, and you book a ticket, you know, or you find the price, and then you go on the website, the airline of the web, uh, the website of the airline, you book a ticket, and that's it. You know, assuming you have the money, it it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, today it's interesting. Today you can't even do that, especially with coronavirus. And it's interesting, like a lot of people are so sad that they wanted to come to Israel or they wish they were in Israel, and they can't. You know, again, I liken it to the. If you guys ever seen the scene in. Um, in the movie Bronx Tale with, with De Niro, I believe, in, and, you know, it's like uh, Robert De Niro, he plays a father, and he's trying to raise a son in this neighborhood in the Bronx, and there's, and his son starts kind of working and running errands for this local mafia guy, and there's a scene in the movie where, um, you know, a bunch of bikers come in to the, uh, to the, the bar that these guys, the mafia guys own, and they just start roughing up the bar, and, they, and at first the guy was just like, you know, can you please politely leave? And these guys was like, no, 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 we just want a beer, whatever. And then they start like, you know, causing trouble again. And and the mob boss is like, you know what? He had he's had enough. So he goes and he locks the door and he goes, now you just can't leave. And then, you know, a fight ensues, a brawl, whatever it is. You know, so I I tell I say this to the people, you know, all the people who were clamoring to come to Israel, whether it was to move to Israel or visit Israel. Now you just can't leave. <laughs> I hope it's. I hope it's not permanent. You know, it won't. I. I don't think it will be, but it's basically Hashem showing you that you know what's what's important here in life. You know, but yeah, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, so so I I I, I wrote this on my wall, and this person responded to me basically that you know he doesn't understand how I could use the word merit, and I basically I'll, I'll tell you what I wrote to him. I I I, I want to. It's interesting. Sometimes you know I I speak on this on this platform. But uh, a lot of the times, for me, believe it or not, it's way easier to express myself in writing. Yeah, not being able to leave Israel would not be the worst fate. Yeah, Alice Bubba Smith. Yeah, I'll tell you something. I never thought, you could, you could look at a statistic. They came out with actually a statistic, statistic of the safest uh, countries during this whole crisis. I think, I think Israel was like number one or number two, behind maybe Singapore or something like that. And, I, and I, I, I was saying that I never thought I'd come, I would, we would come to a place in, in the world and I would you know, say this in my life, that the, it's safer to be right now in, in the heart of Jerusalem than it is to be in New York City. Uh, I'll, <laughs> it's funny, I would say these things before, and, you know, family and friends, certain people would look at me like I had seven heads, but now I think it's true. It's a fact. <laughs> and it might remain a fact for a very long time, maybe if not forever, you know? So I'm going to read to you guys the what I wrote. So basically... And again, I respect this guy's you know opinion that he wrote this. Um, yeah, he's talking about just six million Jews that were murdered, and 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 that you know we should commemorate this and all these kind of things. I just want to let you guys, let you guys know um, I'm not discounting what this day is commemorating. I think we should commemorate the day. I think we should remember. Um, I'll mention something else, but I, I just want to tell you guys that first of all, um, I had 
people in my family, you know, they were not in camps. But my grand, first of all, my grandfather's, uh, before he met my grandmother, his first wife, my grandfather is from a, from a place called Birdichev. And his first wife, before, uh, before my grandmother, was liquidated by the Nazis. He lost his wife, his uh, kid, and, uh, you know, she was pregnant with another one. And my great-grandfather was also liquidated. My great-grandfather had, you know, he was a businessman in Berdichev, which is a well-known place, uh, I guess, for people who know about the Hasidic movement and all these things. And he told my grandfather, my grandfather was an officer in the Soviet army, my grandfather said, listen, we have to leave. And my great-grandfather said, why? You know, he's like, well, the Germans are coming. My gra so my grandfather said, what are you talking about? The Germans in World War I defended us. And my grandfather was like, okay, but this is not World War I. This is something new, and we have to get out of here. So my great-grandfather unfortunately said, listen, you have your, other, your, your orders, I'm staying here. And yeah, and then my grandfather came back to Berdichev after the war, and so he, you know, obviously he knew that his family was liquidated, and he found the Ukrainian policeman who, who kind of led the Nazis uh, to my grandfather's family. He found that guy, and no trial, no jury, and he took his officer's pistol, and he shot the guy on the spot. And for that, there's a whole story for that, that he was, he was um, demoted in rank. He had his, I guess, I mean, at that time, everybody had a communist carrying card uh, in order to move up in the ranks of the, you know, the military. You had to have that. It was just like, not that he believed in communism necessarily. You know, so he lost his whole family. And then, you know, he was like in all these battles. And he, he, is, he actually escaped what's called encirclement, you know, basically a POW uh, makeshift camp that was made. He escaped that twice by the Nazis because he, he, he's figured, okay, you know, in his case, he was a Jew, an officer, and a, and a car-carrying communist member. So he was just like, they, they're not going to interrogate me. They're not, they're not going to give me POW status. They're just going to shoot me on the spot. There was, there was not even going to be a conversation. So he said to himself, well, if that's going to happen, okay, so all things being equal, if I run, you know, if I try to escape, at least I try to escape. And if I, and if I make it, I make it. But in here, if I sit here, I'm going to die. 100% chance I'm going to die, right? If I try to escape, maybe there's a 50% chance I'll die there, so I'll take my chances. He did this twice, ladies and gentlemen. This is my father's father. So, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting here looking at an individual who basically is the, <laughs> the byproduct of a person who decided to take his chances in escaping into the forest or wherever he went. And, uh, yeah, and surviving World War II and the rest is history, as it were. Met, you know, he met my grandmother, who was... 19 or 18 years his junior, uh, they met in Lvov when, you know, I guess he came to Lvov and that was that. And he had my father and his two brothers. And uh, listen, so I'm no, you know, I, I've heard these stories in my family, so I, I don't minimize the event. I don't minimize anything that happened. I don't minimize, you know, the service of Russian speaking Jews in the Soviet army. I, none of that's minimized. You know, May 9th is coming up. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember that as well. Listen, it's actually a national holiday. In, uh, in Russia, it's not a national holiday here, but for me, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a personal thing as well. So I commemorate that. It's called uh, Victory Day, Jane Pabied. So, but at the same time, I'll, see, I'll tell you what I wrote to, to this guy. Um, see, it says, I wrote the establishment of the, because he mentioned the establishment of the state of Israel. He mentioned that kind of thing that is propagated by the, by the Hasbara community. And I said, the establishment of the state of Israel was happening way before the Holocaust occurred. The Holocaust was a culmination slash tipping point of that process. The state wasn't a result of it. That is a canard, unfortunately propagated by our government uh, and self-professed Hasbara people all over the world. I'm sorry, I would love to hear more. Must do a meeting, they'll be safe. Thank you very much, Alice Bubba Smith. If you want, I'll post the, there's a video of my father giving the testimony uh, to a Jewish organization about my grandfather, this whole story. It's like an hour video if you're interested to watch it. So then I, I go on. Uh, no one, he's, cause he's talking about, to me about being like, um, that I'm proud, oh, he said that, yeah, there's no taking pride even if you're a survivor. And I said, listen, it's not about taking pride. It's more of a understanding of the total, totality of the what's called the shleimut, you know, the com complete nature of the process of our people. You know, if you look back at, you know, let's say, granted it's with 2020 vision, it's easy to say that, but if you look back with 2020 vision, you could see that. Um, and then I pointed him, you know, there was a discussion a friend of mine uh, and some of his colleagues had about this whole thing that goes on in Israeli society, and it's a discussion that needs to be had that's not being had, you know, which, which what I'm talking about to you, with you guys right now. 
Um, so he said that, then I'm, he asked me, I'm confused why I use the word merit. And I said, because the merit isn't participating in that process. You know, it's called the power of the makom, the power of the place. You know, like I'm here in Israel and it's, it's you know, the whole nation is doing this, uh, you know, I guess this, this um, having this ceremony or having this commemoration. And it's, and it's a very powerful thing, ladies and gentlemen. Especially in my case, I haven't been here in about six, I haven't done this basically in seven years. I haven't done standing up during the sirens since 2013. And now I, I, you know, I did this for the first time in seven years. It's interesting because I've, I've, I visited Israel, I think four times since I was, since I moved out of Israel, but at no time was I here during Yom HaZikaron um, and Yom HaTzmaut uh, and, and, and Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron. So it's interesting. I think Hashem, it's almost like he, he made it so that I, I, I would only be doing this if I was living here, if I'm, if I'm part of the fabric of society, not just a visitor, and if I'm living here and I'm really, once I'm living here, then I can participate in this, you know, very special thing. It's just in my case, it's my own, it's my own thing. So he says, uh, all these attachments are fine, but I think you could think a little deeper, etc. Maybe watching a Holocaust video. I mean, like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I have, a, I have a secret for you. I'm a World War II buff. And, uh, and I'm one of these people, I will, I will sit on YouTube and from time to time incessantly watch videos about all these battles about World War II, and included in that is Holocaust videos. So I'm not a stranger to watching Holocaust, you know, videos and Holocaust content and content about the Nazis and about Hitler. You know, it's like uh, Jordan Peterson has a video, uh, literally the video is entitled, I've spent a lot of time, time thinking about Hitler. So a lot of these people, lefties, were like, oh, you know... You see, the guy's a Nazi. He spent a lot of time thinking about Hitler. No, it's like in the way that he spends time thinking about Hitler, I spent a lot of time thinking about Hitler, ladies and gentlemen. Not because I love Hitler, but because I want to understand what, you know, how does a person get to do what he did and, 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 and to understand the mind of my enemy, to understand the mind of Amalek and, and, and you know, the, 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 the ever, the person that hates Jews no matter what, right? And to and and you know to understand his reasoning for why he did what he did. So yeah. So he, so then this guy writes back to me, "Good night, you know, nice try, but no." And I said, "Listen, no one's trying here." And I said, "It's just a sense you get when you're here and you're a part of the national consciousness and experience, right?" Um, watching Holocaust videos is good for educational purposes, but that's not the point. One of the reasons that the message of the Holocaust is starting to lose lose relevance for many people around the world, is that the secular Zionist movement made it a construct in order to get secular, to get a secularized sense of holidays, at least here in Israel. So meaning like, they originally wanted to make, make it, uh, I think it was on Passover, and then they moved it to after Passover, and they just wanted to make kind of Israeli holidays, right? Instead of just adding it to Tisha B'Av, right? So was, and then I went on. In the diaspora, they turned it into the separate thing, in line with Armenian genocide, other similar genocides around the world, instead of making it part of a distinct Jew, Jewish story specifically, i.e. the story of Tisha B'Av. It's, been, it's basically become trivialized. trivialized. Um, and then I mentioned, you know, because he said, this, this thing is not about you. And I said, yeah, it's not about me, but I can express my feelings about how I feel on this day. So as opposed to, you know, you know here we stand up and we, we have a moment of silence, right? And we have all these events to commemorate the day. Uh, but in, in the States, you know, you have like Memorial Day, right? So what, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you in America, what happens on Memorial Day? Right. I mean, you, you listen, you do on some measure remember the people who fought and uh, I guess all these things. But like at the end of the day, uh, you're basically it's a day, you know, off from work and you're doing a barbecue. Right. And people go away and they get drunk and they go to the beach and all these things. And you have a sale, you know, shopping Memorial Day sale, you know, where everything's half off. Um, you know, and I wrote in this country, it's part of being the fabric, fabric of being here. And the merit, the merit is specifically in being here. See, and somebody responded. Uh, Mordechai, I read it as being, his being a Jew with the merit of being alive to hear the siren and the merit of his, his being a Jew living in a time when the doors to Eretz Israel are open to Jews. Much like the shofar, there is something about sirens that knit us together. Something about hearing, you know, um, basically a noise that, you know, knits the whole country together, especially now that we had like, you know, what, three elections and this year and a half of horse, uh, horse trading and wrangling and, and, and all these debates about forming a government and you know we had a politician who was fomenting basically Sinat Hinam and in that time at least we we have something some tiny little sliver of thing to to make to, I guess I guess to foment some kind of unity among the people of Israel and then a friend of mine wrote actually my friend Nachliel wrote uh, the last statement have you ever felt blessed to be alive to see something to bear witness to a historic development being in Israel today and partaking in its national aspects even if it's to commemorate 
it, it's commemorative of a tragic event, is something special, and it's, a, it's an immense schut, merit, to be a part of it. That, you know, I, could, I literally could not have said it better myself. Actually, I couldn't, and I didn't. <laughs> uh, so that was that. Uh, yeah, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I just, I, I wanted to mention one more thing. Oh, yeah, there was a question asked. I was, I was listening to a Zoom lecture today, or hearing one. And there was a question asked of the rabbi, um, you know, related to what I just said, you know, do, do you think it's interesting that all of these, or the way the p- person phrased this question, he said, I think it's so sad to me to see these people who survived the Holocaust, most of them are in their, are in their 90s or, you know, some in their 80s, are, are just abruptly dying of, uh, of coronavirus. Most of them are, you know, are in the States, some of them are actually also in Israel, some of them are in the, in the States, and, and he mentioned that, you know, isn't it so sad to see a person who, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, risked his life to put on tefillin in the camps, or risked his life to keep Shabbat in the camps, isn't it so sad to see that person who risked his life for this and that and the other, and then he, he after all that stuff, he just meets his end with uh, coronavirus, right? And the rabbi gave kind of a, an answer you would not expect. It was a little bit of a draconian, I would use the word answer. And he said, um, he's like, I don't understand the question. I mean, he's like, I understand the question, but I don't understand the question. He's like, all of a sudden you care about this person uh, wearing glasses for the first time and realizing you can finally see. Okay, what is that in reference to? <laughs> Please clarify, but... Um, he was saying that, you know, all these things before coronavirus that we thought were nice or, you know, getting together with family, you know, having a minion, this, 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 that, and the other, all these, like, things that we've constructed for our cute little religion, and now that you can't have it, now you actually value how nice it was, right? And he basically kind of related it to that question. Um, and we did not expect that answer. And it got me thinking about just the whole story of, you know, we just came out of Pesach and obviously we were in the desert. And then, you know, in between Pesach, we have, and now we're like heading into Shavuot. So basically, uh, you know, before that moment, we're basically wandering around the desert. And, um, you know, the story goes that the Jewish people were basically like admonishing Moshe Rabbeinu. And they were just like, well, you took us out of Mitzrayim to die out here. And uh, all these kind of all these kind of things, and it got me thinking about. And and also, I I would imagine I think I think there are even sources that point to this that they were like thinking about like how they were tortured and constantly remembering how they were tortured in Mitzrayim, right? And they never forgot about how like they were tortured and this and that and how they. But at the same time, they they like they were kind of like relishing it, not or like they were remembering like oh how much better it was back then. And, and, and why did you bring us out to this desert? It would have been better if we had stayed in Mitzrayim and it would have been much, you know, much better. And it got me thinking about, again, back to the whole identity thing of how, like, we just, you know, if you, if you look at, they did a Pew, a Pew Research Survey in 2013, and they asked Jews around the world, in particular in America, what is the number one thing that you uh, use to identify yourself as a Jew or to connect to your Jew, Judaism or to your heritage? Ladies and gentlemen, the number one answer, survey says, you guessed it, remembering the Holocaust. It's not the mitzvot. It's not even, you know, I think the number two answer was like humor or something like that. It's not any of these things. It's basically just remembering death. Remembering the death of six million people. That is the number one thing that Jews today in America use to connect to their their heritage and their and all of these things and i just found that to be this ladies and gentlemen the saddest thing i've ever heard in my entire life not sad because of the holocaust but sad because that is about as deep as we get i mean it's just i mean i don't even have words for it i mean i could i could actually pull this up you know what i want to pull this up and i want to read the list of things survey jews Uh, okay, da, 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 da. it's funny because now that oh, see now I'm seeing articles that was like they were published recently. Half of Americans don't have Americans <clears throat> don't know that six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Okay, 
At least the Jews do know. <laughs> well, let's see, Pew Research Center. This was a study. I don't know if they had a, another study after that. One, I know the last one they had was in 2000, like seven years ago. I can't imagine much has changed in that respect. Uh, let's take a look. May I help you, sir? <laughs> oh, no, I mean, it's kind of... <laughs> um, no, it just looked like you wanted to ask me something. Um, oh, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. See, now there's an article in 2015. I, I really want to get... Okay, yeah, it's called A Portrait. It, was, it came out in October 2013. It's a PDF article, just give me a second, I'll pull that up. Uh, a portrait of, it's literally called A Portrait of Jewish Americans. At least, at least they use that moniker, not American Jews. Can you just make article Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually quote uh, my friend's, uh, I'll mention to you guys, my friend's brother, uh, my friend Achilles' brother wrote an article about this. So, okay, so here we go, let's just scroll around here. There's a lot of pages here in this survey. It's a, it, you know, it's a very, it was like a very, very scientific study and response. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, let's see. Intermarriage. Okay, yeah, they asked about intermarriage. Jewish, ah, here we go. Jewish identity. Chapter 3. Okay. So basically, listen, I'm not going to get into talking about with you guys religious, not religious. I'm just going to go right to the nitty gritty. Okay. I'll just, I'll just mention one thing. Uh, so Jewish denominational identity, 35% were reform, 18 conservative, 10% orthodox, 6% other, I would imagine, and 30 no denomination. So I would, uh, let's say safely 36% of people are, you know, I guess you can call them, I don't know, maybe unaffiliated or maybe traditional, who knows. Um, okay, Let, let's see. Um... Uh, da, 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 da. I'm just trying to get to the part that talks. Oh, here we go. Okay. What does it, this was just the main question. What does it mean to you to be Jewish? Uh, the key aim of the Pew Research Survey is to explore Jewish identity. What does mean being Jewish, what does Jewish mean being in America? What does being Jewish mean in America today? Okay, I read that sentence properly. Boom. Large majorities of U.S. Jews said that remembering the Holocaust, 73%. And leading an ethical life, 69% are essential to the sense of Jewishness. Now, so now, ladies and gentlemen, my question is, please define for me, and I'm, and I'm actually literally asking you this question, the people who are viewing this uh, live, please, in, in the comment section, define for me, in, in, in like static, def definitive terms, what it means to lead an ethical and moral life. Give me that definition. I would like to know what the heck this is talking about. Next, okay, more than half, 56%, said that working for justice and equality is essential to what being Jewish means to them. Again, ladies and gentlemen, please give me a definition of what justice and equality means today. If, if it means the social justice warrior movement as propagated by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other people like her, I don't know if that's what we're talking about. Um, again, I'd like a definition, all right? Uh, about 4 in 10, so like we're talking 40, like about 43% caring about, okay, caring about Israel, uh, you know, so that was like number, oh, I'll just read to you guys the top things here, Remember, remembering the Holocaust, leading an ethical moral life is number two, number three is working for justice and equality, number four is being intellectually curious, so I guess it's kind of like, it, go, it harkens something back to the Haskalah, to the, to the Enlightenment, where it's just like, you have to just be an intellectual, you have to be intellectually curious, you have to learn as much as possible, I guess you can connect it to kind of like the scholarship aspect of the Jewish people or, you know, even the people of the book. I don't know. I mean, it's just kind of these things are so like surface level to me. And okay, now you get into number five is caring about Israel, whatever that means. And you, you, you care that, 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 you know, the Jewish people or Israel is not torturing the Palestinians or maybe caring that the Palestinians are not throwing rockets at us. Maybe caring that we're not going to get nuked by Iran. I don't know what that means. Caring about Israel. Very bold, very big. Generalized statement. Number six, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, this I will say is important, but to say that it's a, it's a it's a thing that you connect to being Jewish, having a good sense of humor. It's like saying, uh, you know, Sunday dinner at grandma's. You know, it's like somebody asked, what are, what are the similarities between Italians and Jews? Well, we both love food, 
we both value family. We both, you know, whatever, are very fiery people. We come from the Mediterranean. We hail from that part of the world. And, you know, we have similar traits. And, you know, therefore, it's okay if we intermarry. Okay. Uh, okay, and then the next one. Okay, so finally, finally, you get to 28% of people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number seven on the list, 28% of people said being part of a Jewish community, whatever that means. I don't know. And then number eight, 19% of people finally said observing Jewish law. And then 14% uh, of people, which is, I guess, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, was eating, eating traditional, Jew, traditional Jewish food, which means that you can go to a kosher-style restaurant and eat traditional Ashkenazi, you know, roast beef sandwich. It doesn't have to be necessarily kosher. And that's how you connect to um, your Jewishness, your Jewish identity. And I would venture to say, I think, I, I suspect that part of the caring about Israel, uh, I guess, uh, rubric is also going to the parade and wa waving a flag once a year, which I don't even know if we'll have that opportunity. Um, oh, my friend wants to chime in. My father was once with, a, with leading a tour in Istanbul, and they were at the hotel there. Um, and I, I don't remember what the story was. I think that they were... Your father just checkmarked. Oh, yes. yeah. I think that they were... It was Shabbat or something. I don't know. But when the moment Israel was mentioned, a bunch of, of, of people in the swimming pool lifted up their hands showing the red string saying, Israel, I've been there. Can I tell you something about the red string? I, my grandmother has never been to Israel and she told me literally right before I moved back that she probably won't go because she's scared to death or whatever. She can't fly. Her legs... Whatever it is. Her legs hurt. Her this hurts. That hurts. But every time I go, she goes, please don't forget, bring me the red string. The heebie-jeebie thing. The red string. I'm like, Grandma, you don't do, you know, she has a picture. Uh, I'll tell you guys something. I, I love my grandmother. She's so funny. She has a picture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe on her, uh, on her mantle. Why? Because she goes to, uh, you know, what they call a kindergarten for the elderly people where they give them culture food and they, get, they hang out with uh, other you know, people their age, whatever it is, just for companionship. And, and that place is run by the Babachers, you know, by the Chabad uh, rabbis. And I guess they gave this to her and they said, that, you know, just keep this, you know, you know Chabad, I guess they propagate their, their thing and whatever it is. And they're like, yeah, this, is a, this will be a good thing to have in your house. I guess Siman or whatever you call it. So I come to her house and I said, oh, Grandma, you have the, uh, what's up with the Rebbe over here? She goes to me, I have it just in case. I'm like, just in case what? A nuclear holocaust? Like... <laughs> just in case. Then they said in Russian, Navsaki Sluchi, just in case. I was like, that was hilarious. And I'm like, I told her, I'm like, you know, so you, I don't know if you believe in God. I don't know if you believe in, you know, my grandma's one of these people. She, she's like, uh, she doesn't believe that you can change your, yeah, she's a fatalist. She doesn't believe that, you know, you, you even, yeah, it's like the, it's determinism. Yeah, she doesn't believe that you can change your fate. She doesn't, uh, you know, fate is fate. You know, it's called in Russian, sudba ye sudba, right? Uh, no, it's. Um, and, um, and, and basically, you know, and, and this is how you're born into this family and this is what, what the cards are dealt and that is it. There's nothing you can do. There's no story you can, you can. In, in the words of Metallica, nothing else matters. Yeah. No, as Metallica, you know, uh, our friend, um, I forget the name, the lead singer. Yeah. Nothing else matters. 70 to 90 year old women as one lifted their arms. I don't understand that statement. Because they have their tattoos. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Your babushka sounds sweet. Uh, my babushka is uh, in, an interesting person. Let's put it that way. She's an interesting person. Um, my Tesla was interesting. I'll tell you guys something. She saw one of these videos uh, about a month ago when I first started making them, and she called me and she said, What do you need this for? <laughs> I like how do you I don't even know how to I don't even know how to answer that I, re, I literally I hate to give, bring you guys into my world into a kind of private thing who, who, who was the inventor who came to Queen Victoria and he showed like he invented the radio or something and, yeah. she, and she's like what is this good for so she yes. goes your majesty what is a baby good for yes <laughs> no I, li I literally I tell I sometimes tell her I said you know what do we need oxygen for just die just you know stop you know especially now with Corona Ladies and gentlemen, you see this thing that I'm holding up right now? I'm holding up this little apparatus that we all use and we can't seemingly live without, except for the ones that have, uh, I guess some of us have, um, you know, Macs or whatever it is, or laptops. 
if you guys, there's a movie that came out on PBS about the story of uh, Steve Jobs. And I think Steve Jobs came to um, the offices of IBM. You're talking about the late 70s. And he demonstrated the, uh, to them the mouse. He came, up, he came up with a mouse, right? I think it was him when he was working for Microsoft. I don't know the whole story. But basically, he, the scene, he's sitting in IBM offices. And he's like showing them this personal computer. And he shows them the mouse. And, uh, and they're, the guy, the executive at IBM, this sort of archaic guy, he's just like, what am I going to do with this? This thing is ridiculous. Like, what, what, what is the purpose of this thing? In the words of the Beach Boys, what is it good for? Yes. Absolutely nothing. Hijack. No, it's never hijack. It's always uh, greetings, Jack. Salutations, Jack. That's what you're doing. <laughs> it's a, no, it's like the, there's a comedian, uh, uh, Maz Jobrani. He's talking about if you're, if you're an Arab on a plane and you have a friend named Jack, never say hi, Jack. Just say greetings, Jack. Salutations, Jack. Never hijack. So... Yeah, never hijack. Someone's podcast. Anyway, so uh, in any event, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. So, so um, yeah, that's that's the that's where we're at. You know, remembering the Holocaust. Seventy-three percent of Jews. That's what it means to be Jewish. Remembering some event. I guess that uh, I guess it's it it harkens to a some kind of a survival mechanism that we have. Maybe that allows us to survive, and it's like we're looking back on this event that happened, and, uh, you know, we're seeing, okay, this person, my grandfather, or my great-grandfather survived, and then, you know, my father, just like I mentioned to you guys before, I'm the product of this person who escaped the, you know, whatever, the, the, the encirclement by the Nazis, and he ran into the forest, and he survived Stalingrad, and survived, survived being shot at, or whatever, and then my father, you know, was born, and then I was born, and that's that. But I'll tell you guys, just because I remember that whole sequence of events in my family doesn't mean that that is the number one thing that I connect to being Jewish, right? And I want to read to you guys actually an article. Uh, actually, the, my friend who was just speaking on camera, his brother, uh, by, the, by the name of Yaakov Salavan, wrote an article. Captain. Yes, Captain Yaakov Salavan, uh, who's a reserve, reservist in the IDF. And he does very, very important work in the Golan Heights. He lives in the Golan Heights, and he does very important work up there. And uh, he wrote an article two years ago, actually around this time, called, entitled, Stop Holocaust-Based Holocaust Identity. So he says, as a grandson of a survivor and an IDF captain, I find ban banal ceremonies and never again decorations ineffective. After leading an IDF march into Auschwitz-Birkenau, I understood the magnitude of our, of our educational failures. So, I don't know if you guys know, the army every year goes to, sends a delegation to uh, Auschwitz, you know, the, you know, the thing, the, um, I guess the tourist, now it's, it's like a tourist thing, attraction, I hate to say, um, you know, and also, you know, they receive dignitaries there, so every, every year they have a delegation from the IDF come, and, you know, IAF, Israeli jets, fly over, and it's kind of like a show of, like, you know, we've come from the ashes and all these kind of things. So here he, he writes, The last day of our IDF witnesses in uniform delegation to Poland was the mission highlight, entering Auschwitz-Birkenau, the biggest and most terrifying death camp. For me, out of nine and a half years in the army, including battle under fire, nothing can compare on that moment. I march into Auschwitz to, uh, Auschwitz to Birkenau. On my left shoulder is the flag of the Jewish state, and... Uh, I'll just read to you guys because his English is not, writing is not so in the highest level. And to my right, in, oh, in my right hand, I hold a Torah scroll, our, our eternal legacy. In my left hand, I hold pictures of my uh, brave great-grandmother, Matilda Auerbach Hirsch, and her youngest children, five-year-old Shmuel and four-year-old Shoshana, my mother's namesake, all murdered right here over 70 years ago. Surrounded by my heritage, our, our heritage, my responsibility as a combat officer and our, and our fate and destiny, I led 160 officers, the next generation of Israel's commanders. Unforgettable. This result seemingly contradicts the headline, but that's the point. This was one of the very few moments I bonded with the mission. As we landed in Poland, I immediately recognized that I was unenthusiastic, and by the end of the first day, I realized why. So now he writes... In Poland, I feel Jewish. I can't explain it. I feel more Jewish. Only here do I, do I put on tefillin. The opening of our first day debriefing by our, our lieutenant colonel, a dedicated and devoted commander. This was the, the atmosphere of the entire trip. Fol Poland defi defines our identity. Our whole purpose, the essence of our existence, and our, our military service is never again. 
That's what he's giving over. That's what it, that's what they were trying to you know convey to them. The Israeli education system in the IDF failed to build a strong and proud Jewish identity among teen teenagers. That failure affects their motivation as young adults to serve our people and our country in significant roles, especially enlisting for, enlisting for combat. Israel's official remedy for treating this failure was become, has become Poland and the Holocaust. I witnessed this personally. Dozens of soldiers under my command singled out their high school visit to Poland as the key reason for drafting to combat service. My friend recalled that when he was debating if to extend this service, his commander sent him to Poland. As he was landing back in Israel, this colonel called when he was coming, in, what, he, he was coming into the office to commit for, for more years. If Poland is a cure to educational failure, I don't want any part of it. We need to find better ways to justify our existence here to strengthen our, strengthen our sense of mission in the IDF. It is impossible to base an entire moral infrastructure on infrastructure on one event or epoch as tragic as it is. Two months ago, my grandfather, Ben Hirsch, passed away, uh, the last of five survivor siblings, so my daughters won't hear about the Holocaust firsthand like I did from him, like I did from him. The survivors are disappearing, and this, you know, maybe the, relates to what the person asked about, um, you know, the, uh, the people dying of COVID-19, um, and the next generation of Israelis and Jews might see the Holocaust as something ancient and irrelevant, like, like Tisha B'Av. For the respect we have for the Hol for Holocaust memory to endure, we must stop using it as the ultimate motivational source, and rather as a seminal event in our long history as an, as the nation of Israel, a history of thousands of years, tragedies and triumphs full of values and virtues. Israel is now a strong, flourishing country, a startup nation. It is, which also I I personally don't like when the startup thing becomes the number one thing. I don't like that either, by the way. It is time to find better ways to strengthen the sense of connection to the idea of mission and to justify our existence here. It is time to stop connecting everything to the tragic fate of the Jews and instead to look ahead with vision and a common destiny true, true, true to our roots and timeless values. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say, relating to what actually it was a question posed by Yaakov's father, Bernea, um, you know, about all these people dying of COVID-19 and, and, and I related it to the, our time in the desert you know, there was a reason why that generation, I, 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 hate to, I hate to put it this way, there was a reason why that generation had to die out for us to be able to move on and for us to be able to move into the land of Israel. And listen, I think, I think this is what we're experiencing right now. We're experiencing, a friend of mine even told me, we're experience, experiencing a generational change, a generational shift. And yeah, and, th and that's what it is, you know, and, and, it, and it's going to be a thing where I guess my generation, the people who are like in their late 30s, early 40s, who are going to be taking the, the country into the next stage of Jewish history, even, even the people in their 50s. Listen, I don't mean to discount you guys for those of you watching who are, you know, in their 50s and 60s, but like, listen, we're going to be taking the, the Jews into the next stage of Jewish history, you know, and it actually ties in with what I was talking to you guys about with respect to Bibi and Netanyahu and all these things. I think it's interesting, like, people are, like, we're saying, oh, you know, and I mentioned, like, Gideon Sarr, and they were telling me, well, he's not ready, he's not uh, experienced enough, he's not old enough, you know, lest I remind you guys, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the first time he was Prime Minister, I think he was, like, 45, he was 45, uh, Gideon Sarr is 56 or 55 years old right now, you know, um, this is a person who was a Minister of Interior, the Minister of Education, he, he's been in the government in some capacity in high levels for going on, you know, we're talking about almost 20 years. I mean, he's not, he's not a new kid on the block, right? He's not, he's not exactly a spring chicken here. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, like we're, we're now in the next stage of Jewish history. We just had a situation where you guys probably heard we had a, um, I guess some kind of a ragtag unity government formed by Netanyahu and Gantz. And um, I, in my opinion, and if, if you ask me, I don't think this thing is going to last past Lagba Omer. <laughs> Or Shavuot, I think it was just you know made for the purposes of having actually having a government uh, during coronavirus. Not that anything necessarily is going to change. Maybe we'll be able, at least be able to have a budget for certain things, but uh, important things that the country needs. But uh, I don't know. I feel like, especially that BB is going to have his trial. I think I think that uh, we're about to see uh, a changing of, of the guard here in Israel. And it's something that's going to not only be a surprise to a lot of people in terms of like who's going to be the next person, it's going to be very shocking. It's going to ha happen very suddenly and very abruptly. Uh, you know, as the story goes with Purim, Vanahapehu. This whole thing started, you know, on Purim, right? We had the election, and then we had Purim, and then we had the lockdown. And 
you know, it doesn't happen in one day, you know, the uh, who or, or, you know, kind of a, everything flipping on its head is not going to happen in one day. But when it does happen, it'll be very, very shocking and surprising to a lot of people, unexpected. Um, I don't know if, speaking of unexpected, you guys probably heard, uh, what's his name, Kim Jong-un. The story goes that he had, uh, the leader of North Korea had heart surgery, and they say that he's in very bad shape, if, if not dead. If not dead. <laughs> and supposedly his sister might take over the country. And uh, I don't know, we'll see what happens. It might be some serious reforms. You know, she was, uh, she actually participated or she showed up for the opening ceremonies of the Winter Olympics in, in South Korea, in Pyeongchang, in South Korea. And they said that she was like the first North Korean official to, to you know, show up for that kind of an event on, uh, on the, you know, on the soil of South Korea. So we're, we're seeing kind of like this thaw, as we called it in the Soviet Union, of relations between North and South, and we might see something significant. Um, yeah, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, that's what I wanted to give over to you. I mean, it, it was something really special today, and on a deep level, and um, I'm very happy, happy. I mean, I feel very, um, I guess, connected, let's say. Not necessarily happy, but connected, and, and, and it's a big merit for me to be a part of it. Next week, we have, next week we have Yom Karon. Where we, where we honor the fallen soldiers. You know, today, I wanted to mention to you guys today, with regards to Yaakov Sullivan's article, I saw a video of, you know, Hester Yeshiva guys. These are army guys who are in, um, yeah, they're in the military, but, they, but they're going to Yeshiva uh, for, for, yeah, for the program, like it's con in conjunction with the army and a Yeshiva. So these are like religious guys. And these are guys actually in... Um, in a Hesda Yeshiva in a place called Karni Shamron, which is actually one of the places that I, I import wine from, Got Shamron Winery. You guys should really taste some of their wines. Amazing. So these guys, there's a video, they were packing, uh, you know, uh, things for, you know, the elderly, for people, uh, you know, who are suffering from coronavirus. And afterwards, they stood up, you know, for the Yomuzi Karon. And then after that, they sang Anima Ami. So now we have these, like, soldiers where instead of connecting them to their Jewish identity through... Um, you know, taking them to Poland or to Gullus, basically to exile. Um, granted, these guys grew up in, you know, Orthodox families, whatever it is, but there, there's a whole program in the army for these guys, right? There's a whole program to integrate both the spiritual fabric of our nation and the military and service and all of these things and, you know, and volunteering and Hesed and, and helping, you know, people who can't help themselves and all these kind of things. So I thought that was very special. And, and yeah, I mean, like, you, you don't see that stuff. <clears throat> anywhere else in, in, in the Jewish diaspora, at least not that I know of, you don't, you're not going to have an opportunity to see it. And, you know, for all the people that say that, you know, religious people don't serve in the army, you know, I got news for you. Yes, sir. I wanted to interject. Yeah, it's all good. Um, speaking about what is unique is what's happening here in Israel um, with the modern reality of living here, which we really have a tremendous merit to be part of. Um, Yom Yerushalayim, which is coming up uh, it's in, in a few weeks, it's the day in which we celebrate the liberation of Jerusalem, uh, which was captured by the Jordanians right after the, the fall of the old city in 1948, where um, the, Jewish, the Jewish court of the old city, Jerusalem, was cut off from the rest of the country by a siege. And I was actually, yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, I was on the Burma Road, which is named the Burma Road after the road from Burma to China during the Chinese-Japan Wars. And uh, it's basically... Uh, bypassed the regular highway. You need tremendous skill in driving jeeps in order to be able to, to ride it and then to get to Jerusalem to bring supplies to the people who are stuck there for about three weeks. So in, in any event, so we've liberated Jerusalem and we celebrate Yom Yerushalayim. Now, if you want to see a celebration of Jewish pride, you have to come to Jerusalem for Yom Yerushalayim, for Cafe in Yav, that which is like a week before the Shavuot, the 25th yeah. of Iyar. Because on that day, on the liberation of, of Jerusalem, it's like the main highway in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, Yafo Street, which I guess yeah. would be the equivalent of, uh, of uh, Broadway or, or yeah. Fifth Avenue in Down, the United yeah. States. Downtown, or as we call it, town. Town <laughs> is cut off from traffic, and there are tens of thousands of, of teens and adults and people, just men and women, boys and girls, dressed in blue and white, celebrating with Israeli yeah. flags. I mean, you have never seen... Yeah. Like, I, I remember uh, uh, somebody who I know was talking about it, a European who came to visit and saw that he was just ha standing there with his mouth hanging open. Yeah. It's like, 
Yeah. It's just imagine being in Poland where you have to hide in like medieval bunkers to celebrate Judaism, yeah. and here you're in, in the open in the street. It's, I, it's ladies and gentlemen, else. I mentioned the parade in New York. The Israel parade. This is, it's like it's like take that and just multiply it just nu- to yeah, the, the nuclear the, level. The parade is it, it's, it's child's play. It's child's play. Yeah, it's child's play. It's, it's really it's, it's, it's really coordinated by the police, and you come out this, and then there's blocks, yeah. and you have to t- no. Yeah. This is just Mark and David's school. It's cute, whatever. Wait, I mean, I remember, <laughs> I remember, I uh, remember praying. Uh, Mariv, yeah. uh, in a quorum of ten, um, right in the middle of the Muslim quarter, just well, like that. You know, like, you oh, know, yeah. what, what are you gonna do? Yep. Right? It's like yeah. you, for a moment you have a restored sense of yeah. I can belong anywhere and, and, without. A and a lot of people will say, you know, a lot of people even in the Orthodox community will say, well, it's just part. You know, it's only part. The people in the you know the rough cook dati Leomi movement who oh. care about this, but I beg to differ. I saw a lot of people in my yeshiva, even like the Haredi rabbis, and it's, a, it's an important thing. It's an important, you know, we wouldn't have these yeshivas and, and, and all these. No, it's like you, you, you have to understand what, what Yom Yerushalayim is, uh, and, and specifically the fact that I don't remember if it was Ben Gurion who chose specifically to, or, or Begin to use the words uh, the liberation of Jerusalem and not the conquest it's a, it of Jerusalem. It sounds like Begin to me. What? It sounds like it would be more big. It sounds big. Like, in other words, he specifically chose yeah. the word liberation, yeah. shichru, yeah. instead of uh, like of conquest, conquest from someone else. Yeah. Right. So, for example, there were there were wars in Israel in which um, people who are, I guess, ashamed of Jews conquering land, yeah, yeah. that uh, renamed ours. it. Yeah. So, for example, Mibza Yehuda Galil, like Judaizing the Galilee, was changed yeah. to Shalom HaGalil. Yeah. Making peace in the Galilee, because yeah. God forbid that we should, yeah. right? God forbid the Jews should like take anything from anybody right. else. So, so we have that that sense. So what happened was, just historically speaking, um, you know the way the Kotel Plaza looks now. The 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 Western Wall it has a large plaza, but if you yeah. look at pictures of the old city, yeah, was, even from British mandated Palestine, yeah. it's 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 small. It's fragmented. No, it's this. It's like, there's no men and women yeah. section. First yeah. of all, the floor level was much higher. It looks like, but they have like 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 turrets, you know, the gun turrets, kind of like bunkers, little like it's little. It's small. It's yeah. really small. I mean, yeah. it was built a lot. It was built around there. And there was a lot of rubble and trash, and yeah. you know, people would throw Arabs would throw trash there to keep Jews away, and and you could even get bitten up, beaten up going there yeah. at different times. Yeah. And Moshe Dayan, you know, the minister of defense who had the patch on his eye, who was yeah. incidentally yeah. a fifth. Cousin once removed of yeah. my father, very far removed, which, which makes me uh, as related to Prince mm-hmm. Lone Star as Dark Helmet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean you mean you mean Darth Vader? As related as, as yeah, Dark okay, Helmet fine. is to, fine, to Prince fine. Lone Star. Fine, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What does that make us? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely. Which is what you're about to become. <laughs> um, so he had the sense that after 19 years that Jerusalem was cut off uh-huh. uh, and you couldn't go and visit it, that people would just come. Like, this is a week before Shavuot that we yeah. come for Jerusalem. People would come in mass. We would come to Jerusalem. So yeah. what happened was he brought bulldozers, and you can see these pictures online, yeah. and just cleared out the entire plaza, making yeah. it as big as it is today. And in yeah. addition to that, there's a custom now, which people ridicule. People say that on Shavuot night, when usually there's a custom stay, to stay up all night learning, mm-hmm. so what's going to happen on Shavuot night? Uh, oh, yeah, everyone's going to just walk to the old city and pray at the Kotel at sunrise. Okay, why mm-hmm. do you do that? Because, you know, I live four hours away. What am I going to do, learn, study all night? Yeah. Hey, heck, I'm going to kill some time. Let yeah. me walk for four hours. But that's yeah. very cynical. That's not true. That yeah. custom of walking to Jerusalem on Shavuot night started as a result of the uh, the Six Day War when Jerusalem yeah. was liberated. And people just walked. They said, "We want to go to the Kotel." Can I can I say something? About, I'm going to tell you about Six Day War. If you look at everything that was happening in the world, you look at everything that was happening in America. All these like protests, you know, the, all this like the hippie stuff and everything. But like I was, I was talking to a friend of mine, and we, we both, and actually uh, Yom Tov Glazer mentioned this in one of his shirim, in Aisha Torah, he said, there's, it's almost like a portal opened up in the world, and all over the world there's all these like spiritual awakenings. People are realizing, okay, like it's not just about, uh, I don't know, capitalism, and the, I mean, granted, I'm all for it, but like not just about that, it's about something else. People were going to like, you know, the Beatles were going to India and Hare Krishna stuff and this and that. And, and the and the Balchuva movement started. You the, know, among force, the, Jews. the force awakened. The force awakened, yeah. And 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 then we got Jerusalem. The Jews got Jerusalem back, and and that's not an accident that all these things started happening in the world. Uh, I'm, I just found out that actually, so my flight as of now, my flight to the to visit the states is in May seventeenth this year, Jer- Jerusalem Day. Uh, I will be here for Lag Omer, Bezat Hashem. But I, I as of now, I won't be here for Jerusalem Day. But who knows? That might change. They said that uh, New York is going to be on lockdown uh, until May 15th. They said that that might change. Who knows? I don't know. 
if that's the case, maybe maybe I'll be here for Jerusalem Day. Jerusalem Day, we'll see we'll see what happens. But uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, uh, I hope this uh, particular podcast, I guess, instilled something in some of you guys who are watching that it's you know, listen, it is Yom Hashoah. We're supposed to remember this day. Um, we are supposed to remember it. We are supposed to under, understand, you know, who our enemy is. I'll just read to you one thing, actually, speaking of understanding who our enemy is. I'll read to you guys one thing. There was, there was a lecture given by this rabbi, which I'll post later, but um, the main point of the lecture, and, I, and I'll read to you something that was actually written by, uh, it was quoted by Rabbi Avigdor Miller, but it was written by none other than Hitler, may his name be erased in his famous book, Mein Kampf. And I'll read to you guys. I actually posted it on this wall before this podcast. Um, and it relates to our... Let's I'm just give me one second. One second, one second, one second. It relates to... Oh my gosh, I cannot get to this thing. It's not letting me do it. It's not giving me what I want. Here we go. It relates to basically our eternal enemy. So our eternal enemy essentially is the enemy that by the name of Amalek, right? So... There's a lot of people who understand, I guess, the Nazis to be a lot of theories that say that the Nazis are the modern incarnation of Amalek. This is their, our enemy that hates us, I guess, no matter what. He'll always find a reason, right? But here, here's what Hitler wrote, and I'll leave you guys on this note. Here's what he wrote in Mein Kampf. And I want you guys to listen to this very carefully. All this I could understand, that they, the Jews, were dissatisfied with their lot, and they cursed the fate, fate with a capital F, which often struck them so harshly. This much could be understood without, without recourse to reason. But what inev- inevitably remained incomprehensible was the boundless hatred, in this case he meant sinat hinam, uh, um, baseless hatred, they heaped upon their own nationality, despising its greatness, besmirching its history, and dragging its great men, which means Torah scholars, into the gutter. Hitler was referring to the people, the Maskilin, the people in the, uh, we notice the Jews, in particular in his case he was talking about the communists in Europe who basically were propagating the enlightenment and, and nothing really else and they took their own spirituality, their spiritual heritage and what God supposedly gave them and they took it and they threw it basically into the garbage. Ladies and gentlemen, so those of you who want to tell me, well, there was a lot of religious people that were killed in the Holocaust, yes, the religious people were also killed in the Holocaust, uh, they were part of the whole thing, but the majority of, 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 unfortunately, the majority of Jews in Europe had discarded their own heritage, there was a lot of intermarriage, um, listen, I'm not g- going to get into this discussion over why this happened, and why this, why that, that's not for me to say, I'm not even, you know, God. yeah, there's a lot of tzaddikim who even say that they can't even tell you the reason, or this or that, but it, it was evident that it, it seemed like just like we see now with uh, people leaving us during COVID-19 and all these things, and, pe- and, and then the generation in the desert, again, had to pass away for us to go to Israel. You, know, you almost look back and you could, see, you could say, we needed a, you know, like a restart, you, know, like you, you, you turn your modern on and off, as it were. But uh, my main point with this whole thing is to understand that what I said to you guys earlier, you know, that I and one of these people, I watch World War II videos, I watch videos about Hitler, about Hitler's ideology, about Mengele, about, about his uh, propaganda, what's his name, Goebbels, I'm like obsessed with that stuff, right? And much like Jordan Peterson, it's like, I think a lot about Hitler. And, what, and the thing that I've, I've come to realize about Hitler is that, much like most of our enemies, uh, they know about us better sometimes than we know ourselves, right? So... Mm-hmm. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I leave, I leave you. I actually want to thank my friend Nachliel over here for, for his input uh, with regards to all these different, uh, you know, things, from Shalim and, yeah, things with stuff, as we call them. And I uh, hope you got a lot out of this on this very meaningful, meaningful, not happy, but meaningful day. That's really what the Jewish story is. We're not here for super happy, happy fun time and, uh, you know, happy, 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 joy, joy, as Ren and Stippy would say. We're here for the meaning. And that's why the world wants us out, because meaning, meaning requires work. And it requires stopping for two minutes or three minutes and just hearing the siren or the shofar. All right, talk to you guys soon.